Welcome to the Newton tutorial series. I'm Mike Cruz with AC Tech and in this tutorial I'm going to be discussing how to view the particle and triangle work and the triangle force data in your playback file. Now before I actually talk about the work itself I want to make a note about this geometry. Note that the, the two surfaces that I'm interested in looking at the work and the forces on, this back plate and the receiving belt underneath the discharge section have both been meshed up into relatively fine triangles. I mean, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, eight, say, 32 or 40 triangles across that entire belt. And that's because we want to be able to see good resolution of the wear data. If I only had these 10 triangles across the face of the belt, all the wear data would, would be averaged over just these 10 triangles. I wouldn't be able to see clearly where are the wear points on the belt and where are the wear points on the back plate. And a separate tutorial will be discussing how do you properly mesh up these surfaces and make sure the normal vectors are correct and, and all that. I just wanted to briefly touch on that. So the, the work data in Newton is encoded on a per frame basis. So as the simulation uh, progresses, as Newton solves the simulation, each frame that it saves has the work data on each triangle and each particle for just that frame. Which means that in order to get at the work data, I can't just say, well, let's go to, okay, let's uh, color backplate by work. Well, let's first let's say hidden show outer lines, color just that one. Okay. I can't just go to 10 seconds and say, okay, this must be the work from 0 to 10. That's not the way it works. If you go to 10 seconds, it's going to plot the work data from that single frame, but it won't plot any more data until you allow Newton to play back more frames. If I start skipping through the frames, let's go ahead and set this at a fixed scale. 0 0.1. So as I skip through these frames, oh, let's make it even 0 0.04, 0 0.01. As I skip through the frames, Newton will continually be adding the work from these frames to that total work. If I just let it play back, it'll do the same thing. I'm watching the progression of wear in real time. If uh, I jump, say, let's jump ahead to 14, it completely wiped clean the wear data and then it applied just the wear from that single frame. So you can't jump around in the file. You have to go to some specific time and then allow the file to play itself back in order to get at that wear data. Boom, there we go. And this is the same with the particle wear and the tr uh, the triangle forces are different, but it's the same with the particle wear where it's it's cumulative, but once you jump to a different point, it'll reset itself and you've got to let it play itself back. And that's the point of this work summary. You say, well, I want to get a work summary from, you know, say six to eight seconds, generate. It skips you to six seconds, resets the wear data, and then just plays back until it gets to eight seconds, it'll stop. So it's a quick way without having to jump around in the file and without having to tell it to start and stop. It'll just do that for you. Now you'll notice here that um, on the work tab I've got my, my, my min and max and number of divisions for the triangle impact as well as the triangle ab abrasion. So if I set this to zero, zero to zero, Newton assumes that um, I want it to automatically calculate the scale. So it'll set the maximum value 10% higher than the maximum value on the on this um, back plate here. And I, since I see, well, the max value is 0.1, but I want to see a little bit more red. I, there's not enough of a, a variability for me to see where all the wear is. So I'm going to just set this to 0 0.05, oh, 0 0.04. Now we can see where the wear is at. The particles are all falling down and sliding this way. And this is the impact wear, but even for a full two seconds, I'm not seeing a whole lot of impact wear. If I change it to abrasion, say 0 0.04, holy cow, there's a ton of abrasive wear compared to that impact wear. So our max value must be somewhere around 2.25 because 2.5 times 90% is about 2.25. So if I set my max value at, say, 2 or 1.5, well, maybe just 1. Okay, now we're seeing a comparable amount of wear between the impact and the abrasion. But certainly, it looks like there's about 25 times as much abrasion as there is impact. The units that we're using right here are straight 
joules. So all we're doing is we're adding up, continually adding up the wear on each of these triangles. If I change that to joules per millimeter squared, what it does is it takes the work on each triangle and divides it by the area of the triangle. So that's just a little bit better averaging if you were to have um, different size triangles or you just wanted to average over the size of the triangle. Uh, it's, it's more, it, it's more, you can compare it better to other designs or other surfaces that have different size triangles. Similarly, if we want to average this over time, then you should use this third unit which averages it over the size of the triangle as well as over the time elapsed so it doesn't continually add the work performed it will divide that over the elapsed time the triangle rendering mode decides how do we render the triangle wear data to this backplate so if I switch this to triangular what it does is every single triangle gets colored according to its own wear data. And this seems okay, but it's not quite as nice and smooth looking a plot as the nodal rendering. So what the nodal rendering does is if we zoom in here, nodal rendering looks at each of these nodes, each of these points of each triangle, and will average the value from all the triangles around that node. And then it will apply those nodes to each specific triangle. So what it does is it basically smooths out the wear data between the triangles to give you a much more even distribution of the wear. And there's no reason not to use nodal because in reality we want to be averaging that data over the, the face of the over the face of the backplate. There's a few labels that we can use as well. Show total work or show max work. So the total work label is saying, well, the total work on this section that we that we have set to work, the total work performed is 34.5 joules per second. If I wanted to just do the total work, um, the total work not average over time, I could switch that to joules. And obviously, since we know that this wear summary was from six to eight, the difference between joules and joules per second should be a factor of two. So 69.3 divided by 2 is almost exactly 34.5. There's a bit of a rounding error there. But the point is that this is just going to keep on averaging over time. The max work is going to show you the maximum amount of work that is applied to any of these single triangles. And the units for that are going to match whatever my work units here are. So if I was just curious, what's the max triangle? Well, right there, it's 0.21, so that might help me in setting my scale. To reset the work data, as I said, you can simply um, jump to a different point in the file. It'll reset the data. Or if you want, you could even just um, six play. You can just click this reset work data, and it will instantly reset that data. So as the file's playing back, I could periodically, oh, I want to reset the data and let it keep going. Now I want to reset it again. So if I want to color the particles by work, I need to make sure that under particle coloring, I switch that to work as well. So let's show those particles. Let's go back to six seconds. Color the particles by work. Now I go back to this tab and and I say, well, wait a minute, what's going on? How come I'm still looking at the triangle impact where? I mean, my particles are set to color, but they're all gray. And the reason is because you also need to ch decide which work type you want to look at. Right now, this is set to triangle impact. So in order to look at the particle impact, you need to set this to work, but you also need to set this to particle impact or particle abrasion. So now we're looking at the particles. And this is nice because while this work summary is playing back, you could be switching back and forth between triangle impact and a triangle abrasion particle impact, and Newton is still keeping track of all four of these quantities. It doesn't matter what the units are, it doesn't matter what the rendering mode is, it's keeping track of all of these values. So you're free to change any of these scales or any of the units for anything, and it won't disturb the data. So you only need to run the work summary once, and then you can switch back and forth all you want. And as I mentioned, you can switch back and forth while it's running. It doesn't matter. So for the work units, again, we have particle wear, particle impact, and particle abrasion. 
Well, let's change that to, to 1. Now we can see a little bit better scale. Now there's something else I want to show you. Let's go back to 6. Let's do a wear summary from 6 to 8. Let's change this to lines because that's going to be faster. So you'll notice that all these particles in the back have a lot more work applied to them than these ones up here. And you say, well, what's going on there? How come these particles here don't have a different amount of wear? And it's because, like I mentioned before, the wear is encoded on a per frame date on a per frame basis. So because we started at time six, that means all the work that had been done to the particles or done to the triangles before time six is completely ignored. We're not keeping track of that. So at time six, the particles that started dropping here and impact down there, that's the particles we see here. These are the ones that actually have the wear data. So you got to remember that when you do a wear summary from just 6 to 8, you're only looking at the wear performed during that time interval. Everything before and everything after is being totally ignored. And this uh, also brings up another point that I need to, to mention. Um, when you're doing your playback, when you're looking at wear data or creating animations that have wear in them, you cannot have frame skipping enabled because the the again the work data is encoded in each specific frame and if I skip over a frame Newton is not reading any of the data from that frame so therefore it's not going to be reading and encoding the work data and if you happen to do this it'll say hey wait a minute you have frame skipping on but you're viewing work this isn't right you're gonna have wrong wrong uh, wear data and you can kinda see if I look at the the average color here there's quite a bit of red but now for this last half a second, well, there's a lot less work being performed here because about half the work values are, are missing. And if we did not care about the absolute magnitude of the work, if we only cared about the, the work relative to itself, then I guess we could use frame skipping. We'd be missing half the work, but if we only care about you know the work on one section of this plate relative to the other section, well, you divide this by two, you divide that by two, and it's pretty much the same but as a general rule you don't want to be using the frame skipping when you're doing work if you try and create an animation while you have frame skipping on and work enabled it'll do the same thing it'll throw up that error and say hey you can't do that so with triangle forces the options for the triangle forces are very similar to the the options for the work so for instance Let's go ahead and, and hide the uh, hide the particles. We don't want to see them. Let's switch our back plate. Not our back plate. We're going to switch the lower receiving belt to force. All right. Now, the forces are a little bit more complicated than the work because work is work is a summation. Work is um, irrelevant of direction. All that matters is the force applied and the distance that that the um, that the particles moved. But when we're talking about the triangle forces, well, what is the direction of that force and what is that direction relative to? And if I show a top view of the belt, so we're going to go to a top view here, and I'm going to rotate this. Now if I show my particles again and color them by velocity, let's go to 10. The direction of the velocity is 3 meters per second upward in this direction. Now when I orient my model like this and I look at these triangle forces, when I'm looking at the parallel forces, a negative parallel force points against the direction of motion. So these negative forces are pulling the belt backward, pulling it downward, and resisting that, uh, that belt motion. So if I change this, let's change the scale from 0 to 2. We can see that right in this loading zone there are some very strong negative forces, and that's because the belt is accelerating the material in this direction. So that's exactly what we would expect to see. There's a really handy um, section in the user manual that talks about this as well, and I think it uses this exact same example too. So if I go to that post-processing, analyzing perpendicular parallel forces. If I go to this picture, we're seeing this basically this exact same view. <laughs> the direction of the belt velocity points upward, so your negative parallel forces are pulling against the belt, and your positive forces are pointing along the belt. 
you'll notice that up in this section, if I go ahead and let's uh, change my scale from 0 to 0 0.2, no, too much, 0 0.5 you'll see that there are some sections of the belt that have positive parallel force, but there's an even number of sections that have negative force. And that's because the material is just kind of settling right here. Some of the material is, is shifting around and it's shifting forward and backward and that's applying some transient forces to the belt. But clearly the bulk of the force being applied is right here. And we can see if we turn on our screen label, our show total layer force, clearly negative 1700 newtons that's the force that's being applied to this section of the belt. If we had uh, drawn our belt so that it was only, um, if this section only extended out to here, then we'd purely be looking at those, those accelerating forces, the force that accelerates the material. So now according to this, uh, we can, um, well let's look at the perpendicular forces. With the perpendicular forces, uh, it's a little bit different than the parallel, because the parallel was you know positive negative according to that direct you know the 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 parallel forces are a little bit easier to to imagine positive points along that direction negative points against that direction and again those those forces are tangential they're along the face of the belt so they're tangential parallel force if we look at the tangential perpendicular force it's a little more complicated because we have to follow the right hand rule so if we if our the direction of our uh, belt velocity vector is upward again then when we talk about the perpendicular tangential forces the positive forces will point to the right and the negative forces will point to the left and it's very important that you have to understand we're looking at a top view of this belt as the belt is moving upward because if we had if we had if we flip this um, view completely 180 degrees and then we look at it, well now the belt's moving downward and if we still had the mindset that, oh, uh, a positive force points to the right, we're going to be completely backwards. So you have to make sure you understand that. And I think the manual does a pretty good, uh, a pretty good, uh, it, it explains pretty well what, um, what these forces are, what the direction is, and, and why it's that way. So if I go back into my SMV window, Let's change our scale to go from negative 1 to 1. And we can see that based on this, we have a net positive force on this belt. So the material is pushing the belt to the right as it's, as it's entering onto the, um, onto the receiving belt. And if we play that back, we can see the progression of those forces. Another thing to note is that with the triangle work, this was simply the sum of the work over time. We kept adding forces. Maybe we were dividing by the by the, by the time or by the triangle area, but we just kept adding to that. With the triangle forces, these are instantaneous forces which are different at every single frame. So it's necessary to apply some filtering to help us observe those forces. Because if we have no filtering at all and we simply look at the the total force on each triangle frame by frame on a frame by frame basis, Here's what we see. It's pretty tough to see what's going on. I can tell, yeah, definitely it's more red than it is blue here. But because the forces are transient and they can change in the blink of an eye, it's really tough to see what's going on. So by applying an exponential filter or a moving average filter, we can slow down those changes and kind of view the overall trend of the data. And again, that wasn't necessary in the work because the work was just a summation. But because this is directional, it's completely different. And again, there's the screen labels that show our max force and uh, our total force and our max force. You can see that the max triangle value is mm, 2, 1, 2, 3 newtons. And just like with the work data, you can generate a force summary, let's say from 8 to 10 to quickly tell Newton to just generate the forces and watch the force progression from 8 to 10. However, along with um, another thing to note is obviously if I was to look at the forces from 8 to 9 and then compare that to the forces from 9 to 10, I should see pretty much the exact same plot. Because as long as we're at steady state, the, 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 the forces are not being added to each other. It's simply a transient force that we're looking at. So 
the data from 8 to 9 should look pretty much the same as the data from 9 to 10. And of course we have the triangular versus nodal rendering modes again. And we recommend just always using the nodal rendering. So I believe that covers everything I wanted to talk about for these two tabs. Um, again, obviously the user manual talks about uh, both particle work, talks about um, analyzing the particle work and the, the surface work and forces as well. And these little help menus on these tabs provide good information as well. Pretty much the same information that's in this uh, video and the same information that's in the, in the uh, manual, but it's just handy to be able to pop that open and, and see and refresh yourself to what those actually do. So then with that in mind, if you have any other questions about these tabs that aren't answered in the uh, manual or in the other tutorials, then feel free to shoot us an email at info at ACTech.com. Thanks.